Singapore is smaller than New York City, yet 6 million people are squeezed onto just 734 square kilometers, one of the densest places on Earth. Instead of running out of room, Singapore spent $8 billion to create new land its, and expand its iconic Marina Bay. Since 1965, over 140 square kilometers have been reclaimed from the sea, an entire nation built on the idea that when you run out of space, you just make more. But what happens when building your future means rewriting the map itself? Singapore's map leaves no doubt. This is a nation boxed in by water and borders, with nowhere to grow but up or out. The city-state covers 734 square kilometers, less than half the size of Greater London. Yet nearly 6 million people call it home. That means more than 8,000 people per square kilometer, ranking Singapore among the top three most densely populated countries on Earth. Every square meter is precious, measured, planned, and debated. There are no hinterlands or open countryside to absorb sprawl. To the north is Malaysia, to the south is Indonesia, so expansion by annexation is impossible. The island's earliest planners faced a dilemma. How to provide homes, jobs, and green spaces for a growing population when the physical boundaries are fixed by geography and international law. By the 1960s, Singapore's population was already surging past 2 million. Today, that number has tripled, and projections suggest it will keep rising. With each new generation, the pressure on land only intensifies. Every decision about housing, industry, or recreation becomes a calculation in scarcity. The city's planners, led by the Urban Redevelopment Authority, have had to rethink what is possible when the only direction left is toward the sea. The challenge of limited land would soon force Singapore to rewrite its own boundaries, setting the stage for a radical transformation. Long before Marina Bay's towers rose from the water, Singapore's approach to land was already changing. In the late colonial era, infill projects began to straighten shorelines and create space for docks and warehouses. But these early experiments were just the beginning. After independence in 1965, the island leaders faced a new reality. Population growth was outpacing available land, and every square kilometer mattered. Reclamation moved from ad hoc necessity to national doctrine. The government did not just build new neighborhoods, it created entirely new ground to build them on. This was not a short-term fix. Planners began working with a 40 to 50 year horizon mapping out how much land would be needed for homes, industry, and parks decades into the future. The Urban Redevelopment Authority, URA, was given sweeping powers to coordinate this vision. Today, their master plans stretch half a century ahead, guiding every major project from reclaimed coastline to city center. Public housing became the backbone of this strategy. Nearly 80% of Singaporeans now live in HDB flats, and about a quarter of those homes stand on land that was once open sea. Neighborhoods like Marine Parade and Badak are built entirely on ground created by hydraulic fill, compacted sand, and seawalls. This policy of land fabrication reshaped not just the city's map, but daily life for millions. What began as a response to crisis became a defining feature of Singapore's identity, a city determined to make its own future one square meter at a time. Construction at Marina Bay begins with the seawall. Engineers position massive precast concrete caissons, each stretching up to 25 meters long and 15 meters high along the new shoreline. These caissons are floated into place and sunk onto a prepared seabed, their weight locking them together to form a barrier against the open sea. Heavy armor stone is piled at the base to absorb wave energy, while geotextile layers beneath guard against erosion from tides and storms. Once the perimeter is secure, work shifts to hydraulic fill. Dredgers pump millions of cubic meters of sand, 
building up layers that rise 6 to 10 meters above the original seabed. In some spots, sand must be placed more than 30 meters deep to cover soft marine clay. This new ground is far from ready. Without intervention, the weight of new fill would cause the land to settle unevenly for decades. To speed up consolidation, teams drive prefabricated vertical drains deep into the clay, spaced just a couple of meters apart. Surcharge embankments, temporary hills of extra sand, press down, forcing water out of the soil and compacting the layers below. Settlement monitoring plates and piezometers track every millimeter of movement. Only when the ground stabilizes, typically after 12 to 24 months, can foundation work for high-rise towers and underground tunnels begin. Every stage is measured, logged, and adjusted, with engineers on site around the clock. The result is a new city platform, engineered from the seabed up, ready to support the next era of Singapore's growth. Raising an entire new district above the tides is no small feat. For the Marina Bay expansion, engineers set the finished ground at least 2.5 meters above sea level, one full meter higher than earlier reclamation projects. That elevation is not just a number on a blueprint. It is a direct response to rising seas and stronger storms, designed to keep homes and businesses dry, even as climate models grow more urgent. The same standard is now being applied across Singapore's biggest infrastructure projects. Out at the western edge of the island, the Tuas Megaport stands as proof. Built on 1,337 hectares of new land, Tuas is more than a shipping terminal. It is a fortress against the ocean with its own sea walls and polder systems. When fully operational, Tuas will move 65 million containers a year, all on ground engineered to withstand future floods. The Maritime and Port Authority pushed for automation from the start, building a port where cranes and vehicles run on software, not shift workers. On the Eastern Front, Changi Airport's Terminal 5 rises from reclaimed ground as well. With a price tag of $13 billion and capacity for 50 million more passengers, Changi planners demanded the same elevation and drainage standards as Marina Bay. The lesson is clear. Every new square meter of Singapore is built to last, not just for today's needs, but for storms and sea levels still decades away. Singapore's economic strategy relies on a simple but powerful principle. Control the land, control the future. With over 90% of the island's territory held by the state, every new parcel created, especially reclaimed ground at Marina Bay, becomes a direct financial asset. Instead of selling land outright, the government issues long-term leases, usually for 99 years, to developers and businesses. These leases are auctioned through the Urban Redevelopment Authority's Government Land Sales Program, often fetching billions of dollars for a single district. In recent years, la land lease revenue has ranged from 10 to 17 billion Singapore dollars annually a sum that rivals or exceeds the cost of even the largest reclamation projects. This steady income is not just a windfall. It funds new infrastructure, pays for future reclamation, and underwrites public housing and transit. The model turns every square meter of new land into a revenue stream, helping to sustain Singapore's per capita GDP of over $80,000 and fueling the city's relentless reinvention. The result is a self-reinforcing cycle. Reclaimed land pays for itself, and then some. Singapore's race to build more land now runs headlong into limits set by nature and politics. Sand, the raw material behind every new district, has become a flashpoint across Southeast Asia. In 2007, Indonesia imposed a sweeping ban on sand exports after entire islands began to vanish from its coastline. Malaysia soon followed with its own restrictions. For Singapore, these moves triggered a scramble, engineers and diplomats scouring the region for new sources, while prices soared and environmental protests grew louder. 
Marine scientists warn that every shipload of sand scraped from riverbeds and seafloors means lost seagrass, collapsing fisheries, and coastlines that may never recover. The ecological toll has become a source of regional tension. The government has responded with coral transplantation and artificial reefs, but those measures have not erased the damage. To shield itself from future shocks, Singapore is experimenting with alternatives such as crushed rock, recycled construction debris, and polder techniques that use less fill. Meanwhile, the nation has committed over 100 billion Singapore dollars to defend its shores, raising reclaimed land, upgrading seawalls, and building the marina barrage to hold back floods. The question hangs in the air. How long can this model hold as resources dwindle and the region pushes back? Singapore now sells reclaimed land for billions, funding its future in a world of rising seas and shrinking resources. As global cities face climate and density crises, the island's experiment isn't just about space, it's about survival. The world is watching to see who adapts fastest.